Welcome back. Uh, hello, Tim. Uh, Hi, Perrette. <laughs> Uh, so, um, welcome back to the first session of today entitled Cyberspace and Cyberspace Operations. And I'm delighted to introduce our moderator, Dr. Tim Stevens. He's senior lecturer in global security and head of cybersecurity research group at Department of War Studies in King's College London. And I had the honor to co-edit with Tim also this book. And uh, we have uh, four um, scholars who will present their papers. Uh, two of them are here in Tallinn and two are uh, remotely. And I believe we will have them on the screen. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, many thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, hello to everyone from a very sunny London. Um, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce to you uh, this excellent panel of speakers. Uh, each will present for 10 to 15 minutes, which should bring us up to the one hour mark. And then hopefully we'll have a, um, about half an hour for questions. Um, so please, as Prit in the previous session said, please do put your questions in the chat box or if you're in the room uh, in Tallinn, raise your hand or indeed on Teams, you can virtually raise your hand as well. And Perret and I will try and make sure that the questions get to the right people. So um, our first speaker today is James Lewis, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you. He's uh, the, the senior, a senior vice president at the Centre, or <laughs> A or V, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Centre for Strategic and International Studies at, at, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Jim is going to talk to us today uh, about a strategic outlook for cyberspace operations. Jim, over to you. Thank you. I'm one of many. Uh, so uh, it's... It's uh, great to see you all. It would, of course, be better to be in Tallinn, or for that matter, in London, but uh, uh, Washington's having nice weather too, so I can't complain too much. Um, the British historian Paul Kennedy wrote that great powers do not decline because they fail to recognize problems. They decline because they apply old solutions to new problems when they are no longer effective. The new problem for today is in cyberspace. This is the focal point for conflict. Uh, old strategies are ineffective. Uh, Russia and China hold the initiative in cyberspace. Increasingly, they do not appear to mind being caught. Uh, that's a worrisome indicator. Um, calling this new conflict a gray zone uh, is misleading. It is not a gray zone. It has become the principal venue for hostile engagement. It does not fall between war and peace because these old distinctions do not map well to today's contests. Um, NATO exists to deter attack on democracies. And after a long period of struggle, it, has had, it had remarkable success uh, in the 20th century. But either by design or luck, our opponents have developed strategies that allow them to circumvent deterrence by staying below the threshold of action that would provoke retaliation. And I think most people would recognize this threshold as the use of force threshold, um, with few exceptions. This is the core strategic problem for NATO. How does NATO defend itself in a situation of calculated aggression where we are unable to prevent our opponents from taking hostile action uh, using our current approaches. Countering cyber action is much more difficult than responding to an armed aggression. When a tank crosses a border or an airplane violates your airspace, people know what to do. There's much less clarity, if any clarity at all, when it comes to cyberspace. Cyber operations are ideal for conflict in this new environment. They offer the ability to damage an opponent and to gain strategic advantage without engaging an opponent's military force. Cyber operations create the cognitive and political effect that erodes an opponent's will to resist, providing the political means for victory or advantage without defeating armies. Um, the influence campaigns that we see the Russians and now increasingly the Chinese engage in are a violation of so sovereignty and they're coercive by intent, but they do not involve force. Existing international humanitarian law 
with its protections for non-combatants, are not easily applied in this digital conflict. And of course, there's been a long discussion in the past of the distinction between combatant and non-combatant being eroded by modern warfare. The cyber continues and accelerates that trend. How different is this strategic challenge from what NATO faced in the past? Uh, the risk of cyber attack on critical infrastructure or command and control networks are not that different from an attack using conventional weapons. Uh, I think they're unlikely because we have a fairly well-developed idea of what the response would be if you were to attack physically critical infrastructure or use a cyber attack that produced uh, equivalent effect. This makes it easier to plan a response. The problem arises from a new and more difficult unconventional challenge, a continuation of politics by other means, to quote our favorite German theorist of war, a continuation of politics using cyber operations. This means the strategic challenge for NATO is to find new ways to blend its conventional deterrence functions, which have been successful, with new strategies for cyber action. NATO has made progress in adopting to cyber warfare, but a cyber strategy requires more than defense. A new cyber strategy must also be embedded in NATO's larger approach to a hostile China and Russia. I, I think there's uh, sometimes a, a wishful thinking, uh, certainly in the private sector and perhaps in some governments, that um, we can continue to have the sort of global economic environment that we had uh, before 2015 or even before 2010. Um, I think that is like a balloon with the air coming out. It's deflating. Uh, Russia and China have an alternative view of how the world should work, and they are perfectly willing to use coercive measures to advance that view. That doesn't mean there isn't room for negotiation, although I note that in speaking to some Chinese government colleagues, they said, when we meet, it will not be a negotiation because there's nothing to negotiate. Um, that was a bit worrisome. Uh, in contrast, Russia's strategy is to prepare for highly disruptive cyber actions in the event of conflict. But in the interim, they'll use a campaign of espionage, political action, and low-level disruption uh, before that. And sometimes the Russians call this pre-conflict shaping, which is also worrisome. China will pursue a steady course of increasing economic, informational, and cyber pressure on NATO. I was talking to some researchers yesterday who told me of a Chinese espionage campaign that included American and European targets that had been going on for seven years. Uh, so the idea that uh, we are not confronted by damaging actions in cyberspace, we all know that's, that's not the case. NATO's ability to send a collective message of resistance and to establish a credible threat of response may be its most valuable assets in this new conflict. Precedent suggests that authoritarian opponents are opportunistic. They can be surprised at their success and a lack of response. I had a Russian colleague connected to the FSB tell me in 2017 that the Russians were, I'm putting, paraphrasing what he said, the Russians were surprised at the lack of response to their election interference in Europe and the US. And they saw that as kind of a green light. So we need to think that uh, if they receive a check or they, if they perceive unacceptable risk, our opponents will adjust their strategies. This is where NATO has an opportunity. Uh, I propose three sets of actions that NATO could consider to improve its cyber defenses and to reduce the attacks, cyber attacks on its members. First, NATO should persuade its opponents that they cannot expect to be covert in their operations. The goal is to show that covertness, covertness is not just difficult, it is impossible. This will shape, this will shape their assessment of risk. Um, while they don't mind being caught, I think they do mind having their operations disrupted. So our ability to remove the cloak from their operational capacity um, perhaps using forward-leaning measures uh, is a crucial part of this. 
Russia and China already overestimate some NATO members' ability to attribute the source of an attack. Honestly, attribution is getting easier. Uh, again, talking to uh, another researcher, he said it's difficult but not impossible. And our job is to persuade the, our opponents that everything they do will be known and will be accompanied by some kind of response. Um, denying the possibility of covertness, covertness may decrease the likelihood of opponent action. Second, NATO needs to develop a menu of proportional responses to malicious cyber actions that run the gamut of awful responses. Much of this, of course, will be done by member states, but there would be a benefit to coordination uh, within NATO to think about how th there is an opportunity, if there is, for collective action, uh, and to look at the different capabilities, cyber capabilities of the member states uh, in the offensive arena, uh, beyond defense. Of course, there cannot be any automat automaticity in implementing this menu of proportional responses. Uh, Article 5 applies as it does in anything. Um, but developing uh, common understandings of what is a proportional response is crucial, along with the ability for improved attribution for changing opponent calculations of the risk of cyber attack. Um, NATO can build on the joint statement of September 2019 from 28 countries who agreed to work together on a voluntary basis, I'll quote, work together on a voluntary basis to hold states accountable when they act contrary to the UN framework of responsible state behavior, including by taking measures that are transparent and consistent with international law. That's a good guide for action. Uh, third, NATO needs to demonstrate that it and its members will be resilient in the event of an attack. This is more difficult. Uh, NATO has done good work in hardening networks, and member states have made varying degrees of progress in improving their cybersecurity. But we're also talking about political resilience. This is not a military task. This isn't a task for NATO. But we can use the platform in Brussels as a way to communicate to member states the need to strengthen their political environment. And of course, this clearly applies to the US, but also to Germany, uh, to Britain, uh, to other European countries. Uh, resilience is both the way we think of it normally in cyberspace, but we also need to think of political resilience. Our goal is to shape and constrain opponent actions, building on NATO's success in the conventional sphere but this requires developing uh, a stronger attributional presence, a menu of proportional, proportional responses, and building the political consensus to use those responses. Um, these are delicate times, and we are in a period of conflict with author authoritarian states. Um, that's unavoidable. But collective defense remains the best tool to protect democracy. And with that, thank you. I'll stop there. Great. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, that's a really insightful, uh, high-level view of the strategic environment. Um, also, warnings against the, the perils of, of a deterrence mindset, one might say, uh, and and upon over relying upon self restraint. That self restraint. So there's definitely a program of action there for NATO member states uh, to consider. Um, a credible roadmap, if you will. So thank you very much, Jim. Um, the next paper is by Jason Healy and Veer Pratap Vikram Singh. Veer is with us uh, online. Um, Veer is from the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, uh, along uh, with Jay Healy, of course. Uh, and Veer Pratap is a cyber and digital fellow at Columbia. So uh, Veer, you're very welcome. And over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, 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 Tim, sorry. Um, I'm just going to uh, share some slides to, to help get across what uh, Jay and I had uh, had written about and uh, gotten across. Sorry, uh, just let me know if there's any. Hopefully everybody can see this. Wonderful. Um, so. Uh, the paper that uh, Jay and I uh, worked on uh, builds on uh, four mechanisms that he and Robert Jervis 
had uh, worked on in 2020. And in in that paper, uh, what Healy and Jervis identified were these four mechanisms by which cyber operations could have a, de a stabilizing or destabilizing effect. And our paper looks to expand uh, that how we look at these four mechanisms by looking at the underlying context of geopolitical and cyber tensions that can impact how uh, these mechanisms can play out. Uh, we we conducted this by examining four different situations, um, by examining the four different situations before mapping them out to uh, a two by two grid uh, of both high and low geopolitical and cyber tensions. Uh, we subsequently applied um, these uh, these these trends, these tensions to uh, two prevailing trend lines uh, to help present a picture of what we believe is the future of cyber conflict. Um, so as you can see uh, up on the slide, uh, we've got all four of the mechanisms that that Healy and Jervis uh, had identified. Uh, the first, which is the only stabilizing mechanism, is uh, has was dubbed pressure release. Uh, along with, you can see the three other destabilizing mechanisms, spark, uh, pull out the big guns, and escalation and version. Uh, pressure release is perhaps the most frequented mechanism that we've seen where cyber, cyber operations are used as a non-threatening, non-kinetic option uh, as, as a tool really for uh, to, de, uh, to maintain status quo, uh, maintain stability, and provide an effective off-ramp uh, for rivals that are building that are otherwise building towards a conflict, uh, it is worth noting that um, this use of cyber as a pressure release tool has has resulted in a bit of a chain of tit for tat cyber action, uh, which is which becomes increasingly uh, relevant as we as we move forward. Um, Spark, as you can again uh, see on the slide, um, is is destabilizing in nature due to the uh, covert nature of cyber actions in, in by design. Um, as And as a result, as states develop their own cyber capabilities, uh, a sense of anticipatory paranoia, anger, vengefulness sets in, especially once an incident has occurred, uh, which can help pull states towards, uh, towards conflict. Uh, pulling out the big guns is part of a bigger shift towards destabilization, where uh, in, in the face of an acute political crisis, uh, states become more willing to uh, surrender the kind of tacit agreements that have been established in peacetime and instead move towards more provocative and risk-seeking behavior. Uh, and finally, escalation inversion uh, takes place largely when war is seen as an inevitability and um, States believe that surprise, uh, a surprise large-scale cyber conflict is is the best course of action, especially to help keep uh, victim states uh, unbalanced in early states of of a conflict. Um, as as was mentioned previously, it becomes it can help sort of lay the foundation for uh, for a conflict to take place. Um, so what we did is we took these four mechanisms and we applied them to a to this matrix of high and low tension. Um, so the two different types of tensions that we looked at were geopolitical tensions and cyber tensions, where geopolitical tensions are the stress factors that can contribute to uh, the creation of a crisis. So uh, states that, that actively seek to avoid conflict and want to keep maintain a peaceful status quo, they'll have a low geopolitical tension. A high geopolitical tension could be seen by states that actively engage with each other on either imposing economic restrictions, sanctions, interfering in each other's political processes, uh, as well as we're seeing nowadays uh, building the creation of new alliances as well as uh, aggressive military dis displays. Um, cyber tensions are driven in by the state's perception of cyber activity. So this could uh, this varies from the low end, where uh, cyber actions are fulfilling the intelligence contest criteria, whereas high tensions can come about when uh, cyber actions are breaking norms and where cyber criminals are given safe harbor, and in other cases where it's just reckless uh, reckless action in cyberspace, as we've seen in, in both of the recent past and not-so-distant past. 
Um, and as you can see with the with the table on on screen, you can get an idea of how uh, all four of these mechanisms can kind of be can kind of be bucketed into uh, areas where there's both high and low tension. And what we found is that um, that increasingly these destabilizing mechanisms will push parties towards uh, quadrant two, where tensions are both high and conflict is far more likely to break out. And this can be a little bit a little bit more seen in this. This is just an, uh, a collection of the um, of the the mappings that we put down in our paper, where you can see in where you can see in Spark. Um, as well as big guns and escalation inversion, that there's a movement towards quadrant two, uh, which we felt was extremely um, pertinent to what uh, what we then looked at, which are these uh, trend lines. Um, so, keeping in mind the, the context of this workshop, we we looked at two different trend lines for for the future and how uh, we view the future of cyber conflict playing out. Uh, the first trend line that we looked at was increasing geopolitical fi uh, friction. Uh, he, uh, Jay and a colleague of ours at Columbia, Jack Snyder, worked on, uh, have written a paper which is yet to be published, uh, but it looked at how uh, the use of cyber as a pressure release may not necessarily be unique to cyber conflict, but may in fact be more representational of a post Cold War global status quo, which has an inherent desire to avoid escalation. And as a result of the kind of recent geopolitical shifts that we're seeing, uh, whether we whether you want to look at uh, great power competition or uh, just these extreme events that are coming about more and more frequently, you know, the COVID pandemic, the uh, increasing migration crises, the climate emer emergency, as well as domestic extremism, they're all contributing to this to this propagation of, uh, of increased geopolitical friction. Uh, the, second is, um, the second is an intensification of cyber actions. Uh, as as uh, Colonel Taran mentioned uh, during his opening comments, we've, we've kind of now seen how these, how actions that would have otherwise been risky and outrageous in the past um, have, have now become almost routine. And, you know, just a, again, to dive into the recent past from, the, you know, whether it's December 2020, March 2021, or uh, May 2021 as well, we've seen these very aggressive and, and uh, somewhat outrageous attacks in, in the United States. Um, and, these, and these kind of incidents can be seen as being accelerated by uh, more technological and policy developments. So if you want to look at uh, the development of AI or machine learning tools being applied by offensive actors, or a lack of regulation on cryptocurrency that uh, that allows the further monetization of cyber attacks. Um, and what we what we found is that um, sorry, what we found is that um, there's a, a propensity for these. Uh, for this intensification to result in a shift of uh, the kind of incidents that we're experiencing. So you can see in, in the figure on the slide that uh, more and more we're going to experience uh, extreme cyber events, which uh, become worrying, especially as we look at these trend lines and we look at these, uh, these quadrants that are, at, that are at play in this movement towards a high, and, uh, a high geopolitical and high uh, uh, cyber tensions. Um, another X factor is the dependence on technology. Uh, we're seeing more and more countries uh, dive into um, developing their own uh, their own technological capabilities, uh, integrating either through the the Internet of Things or just uh, developing in gen developing technology in general. And this can create an extremely uh, unpredictable factor because. Uh, an attack that may have stopped at uh, at the door can now perhaps carry over into more and more systems, uh, becoming a, becoming a lot harder for politicians and uh, decision makers to uh, avoid addressing it and to just shrug off that those cyber operations. Um, tying all of these together, uh, we we believe that uh, it that these conflicts um, and these incidents 
bring us towards a ratcheting forward of cyber incidents where um, everything is progressing towards this chaotic quadrant, uh, quadr quadrant two, where uh, conflict is going to be more and more prone to occurring. So, so what about cyber, what about pressure release? What we've noticed is that uh, these prevailing trends are not only pushing actors more towards conflict, but that they also reduce the effectiveness of pressure release. So in the past where uh, an individual pressure release action may help reduce tensions, because of the prevailing trends uh, that are experienced, um, it's less likely to, pressure release actions are less effective. And over time, they become even less effective because institutional memory starts to build and that helps contribute to more aggressive posturing, more desire to abandon the kind of tacit agreements that may have been at play. Uh, and that, and that again, feeds that destabilization. Um, so before I, before I wrap up, uh, I did want to point out uh, a number of curveball events that we, that we mapped out. We did want to uh, make sure that we brought them up, no matter how improbable they might seem, uh, especially because we're talking about future trend lines. Uh, and and this can this can vary wildly. Uh, for example, we've we were uh, we believe that if there was by some chance uh, a rapprochement of between the United States and and China, uh, as we somewhat witnessed in 2015, uh, that could substantially alter the this trend line that we're witnessing. Similarly, if uh, if there's a post po uh, post Putin Russia. Um, it may be more willing to step back from confrontation with uh, with the West, um, and and this goes on and on of, of these di kind of different what ifs, uh, especially for example like the role that the private sector could take in reeling back um, the use of uh, the use of cyberspace as a military domain. Um, with that, I think I'm going to uh, wrap up and uh, turn it back to Tim and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Svea. Um, this is part of, of course, this paper is part of an important um, uh, project that's going on at Columbia about escalation, which is informed by the central promise that just because cyber hasn't yet escalated, it doesn't mean it won't in the future. Um, and I think uh, uh, Jay and Veer and, and colleagues are putting some very, very interesting flesh on the bones of that thinking, um, particularly note here the, the, the increase in tensions in the strategic environment and some systemic um, aspects as well. So thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, we'll uh, just remind participants that if you have questions, comments, observations for the participants or, in, or the panelists, or indeed if the panelists have questions they'd like to pose to one another, um, we can either put those in the chat or we'll come to those um, in due course. Great, thank you, Veer. Um, our next paper is Franz Stefan Gaddy, who's a research fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, as Perez mentioned earlier, uh, Franz is going to talk to us a little bit about joint or domain operations and cyber threats to nuclear C2 and C3. So, uh, Franz, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, rather, to those. Uh, uh, coming in from the East Coast in the United States or wherever. Um, great pleasure to be here. I'm gonna be talking about um, this concept that was discussed earlier also, uh, essentially NATO's new warfighting concept and to what degree joint all domain operations um, once this concept is implemented in a decade from now or uh, at some point in the 2030s, to what degree um, it increases cyber vulnerabilities. And in the paper that I'm presenting, I'm just merely taking the extreme case of highlighting vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities in uh, nuclear command control and communication systems uh, within the NATO alliance. Um, it could be also other systems, but I just tried to um, really go to the worst case scenario here. and. Um, in the spirit of what the Colonel said in his introductory remarks, uh, I'm trying to be uh, controversial immediately in two ways. One is that um, I have a specific scenario in my 
uh, paper where I single out Russia as the bad actor who is intro introducing some um, malicious code into um, US networks, thereby escalating tensions between NATO and Russia. And at the same time, I'm also not referring to multi-domain operations, um, but joint all domain operations, which is um, perhaps a small small uh, distinction here. But um, my, my point is that um, maybe in 10 years from now, NATO will have moved away from joint all dom uh, from multi-domain to joint all domain operations because that seems to be the trend also um, in the United States at the moment. In any case, uh, could I have the, the first slide, the next slide, please? Thank you. Just a quick uh, structure that I'm going to talk about in my scenario and then just walk through the uh, structure of my paper, essentially. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, this is much better. <laughs> oh, well, here we go. So um, the scenario that I have in my paper um, is called Springstorm 2031. It takes place here in Estonia in 2031, and it's... Um, really in detail lays out um, how a US-led battle group, NATO battle group, conducts exercises uh, near the Russian border. And um, this is the first time on a large NATO level that this battle group is equipped with the so-called advanced battle management system, which is essentially um, an AI-enabled battle management system that is already in the works in the United States. There are some experiments, some testing. Each of the individual service branches in the United States is working on different, different concepts pertaining to essentially AI-enabled um, battle management systems. So this is, this is something that is already um, in the pipeline here, and, and, and this, this uh, battle management system essentially enables um, a military internet of things that really connects sensors and shooters and is really um, um, aimed at establishing information superiority, thereby increasing the operational pace of operations and thereby um, outpacing essentially decision making of the adversary and um, guaranteeing that we are, well, NATO rather takes, um, uh, has the advantage in any com um, competitive phase, competition phase, or in an actual military conflict with some of our new peer-to-peer -peer competitors. Um, in my scenario, this um, ABMS, the Advanced Battle Management System, is made possible by um, a new NATO Joint Warfighter Cloud capability that is essentially just um, an, integrate, an integrated um, cloud architecture that integrates hundreds of smaller clouds um, within the NATO alliance, and this is primarily used uh, for data sharing and really storing information, storing intelligence, storing ISR data and accessing it um, in the battle space. And um, as I outlined here also, it's a key technical requirement um, in order for the advanced battle management system uh, to work. Now this is uh, the technical aspect here, and, and in my scenario you have some GRU cyber warfare specialists that um, target cloudlets um, of US vehicles that are um, connected to this advanced, uh, through the advanced battle management system to this um, internet of military things, um, where um, these um, GRU cyber warfare specialists are, re are really successful at tracking, tracking this uh, battle group um, in um, Estonia, why are this so successful? Because um, a lot of the soldiers who are participating are not really keeping up with um, ele electronic signature discipline. That is, some soldier sneaks in his cell phone and snaps pictures of the exercise and sends them to his girlfriend. Um, this, um, the, the GRU, GRU uh, specialists are picking this up and locating specific vehicles and can actually, um, by uh, geographical proximity, uh, uh, insert a polymorphic uh, software package, a malicious code, essentially a worm, that quickly over uh, a couple of days gets um, distributed um, under this, uh, in this advanced battle management system. And um, this malware actually, despite all the safeguards that in place, and in my scenario, I also want to point out, I'm really pr uh, painting the perfect storm here. Um, spreads all the way to U.S. Uh, strategic command and U.S. nuclear command and control capabilities. Why is that the case? Because 
Um, in my scenario, by 2031, tensions, particularly on the nuclear um, level between Russia and NATO, have escalated to a degree that it is absolutely necessary that uh, NATO has to think about reintegrating tac tactical nuclear scenarios, nuclear warfighting scenarios, into all of its exercises. And um, there are some specific um, ideas also in the United States in particular about integrating the advanced battle management system or joint all domain operations um, into, into um, nuclear command and control architecture, although the exact interface and how this is going to happen um, is unclear at this stage. In any case, in my scenario, within four days of the breach, um, um, a couple of ABM systems and multiple uh, displays at strategic command go dark and this leads to a nuclear crisis between NATO uh, and the United States. And um, this is really um, meant to illustrate the increased vulnerabilities um, that all domain uh, command and control, or all domain operations can actually bring if we succeed at integrating um, both conventional and um, nuclear uh, capabilities, but also um, integrate other um, capabilities across uh, service branches, across NATO militaries, and across, across individual uh, domains. Now, can I... Um, have, oh, sorry, that's my next slide is, um, here's just a quick overview of NATO joint all domain operations and cyberspace, a tentative definition from the NATO joint air power competence center, what uh, joint all domain operations uh, pertains to or how it is defined, as we have heard in the previous uh, presentation, this idea of joint all domain uh, operations or multi-domain operations um, within NATO, um, a definition is not going to be expected until uh, February 2022, most likely. Um, the key, I think, to understanding all of this here that is, is that all of this work that's going on at the NATO level is essentially underpinned by what is happening in the United States from a conceptual and doctrinal um, um, debate. So it's really all about U.S. joint domain, all, uh, all, excuse me, joint all domain command and control concepts. Um, and, and underpinning this uh, joint all domain command and control concept is, um, again, a mesh cloud and network architecture that is really integrated with uh, a, an advanced or AI-enabled battle management system. As I said, um, JADO remains in conceptual development, and um, the rest you have heard already in a previous um, presentation. Now, um, how or to what degree will uh, NATO joint all domain operations and NC3 systems um, in integrate essentially? Here's um, really my focus in my paper is really just on the US side. I'm not talking about French or British nuclear command and control and communications capabilities, um, but really on US systems. There are around 160 systems um, around and most of them or all of them as we know are isolated from the internet and, and mission critical networks are air gapped. As I said, the idea, and this is based on a couple of public testimonies, but also interviews that I've conducted, um, there will be several different uh, interfacing mechanisms that could be possible. And um, what's most likely or where this um, um, uh, integration is most likely to occur, and this is also happening in the scenario that I outlined in my paper, is really um, where um, active during active military operations or exercises, um, battle space commanders, regional um, combatant commanders, and, and, and so forth are live feeding live battlefield battle space updates, or at least um, the advanced battle management system, sensors and shooters are feeding information um, into, into this advanced battle management system, which then um, really shares the most pertinent um, information um, with the help of machine learning algorithms with um, national command and control and communications um, systems in the United States. And based on this, they're going to increase or decrease nuclear threat assessments. And this is one of the key concepts, I think, that you can see when you, when you, when you read up on this stuff. And I think it's worthwhile pondering over it, whether, to what degree this is really, really, really a good thing in the long run. Um, I think the other, the other question is um, the extent, because um, 
NC3 in the United States is currently being, being upgraded, to what degree really strategic communication systems can stay separate um, from other communication systems. I think this is also unclear under these new reforms that are ongoing and under this concept of joint all domain operations. And um, as I said, I'm not drawing any firm conclusions in this paper. It's really mere, um, more of a food for thought paper, but I do think that this integration of joint all domain command and control um, and this new uh, NATO warfighting concept makes it a strong possibility that um, conventional nuclear um, C3 remain or will be stronger connected in the future and also uh, more integrated into, into um, network architectures in general. Now here specifically NC3 cyber risks that I outline in my, in my um, article. I already um, mentioned the entanglement of conventional and nuclear uh, C3, that there's an increased risk of cyber operations triggering escalation to the nuclear level. I should say at the same time, um, this is not something that automatically happens, and I also try to describe this in a scenario. Any form of escalation, whether it's vertical or um, um, horizontal, horizontally, um, ultimately uh, depends on leadership decisions, right, to a certain degree. However, however, I think uh, the risk is definitely going to get uh, bigger and is going to increase in the future just because um, these AI-enabled um, algorithms or AI machine learning, whatever you want to, uh, whatever the definition here is exactly, um, there's a strong possibility that um, because of cyber attacks, uh, offensive cyber operations, um, a lot of the